to give you some background, our organization has gone from vaccinology to oncology to COVID. So uh, I know that may sound surprising, but we've been in the whole DNA, RNA, protein pathway from the outset almost a decade now. And one of the ways is to modernize vaccinology was actually use a whole power of genomics. And so we have a DNA construct that we can insert into a vector. Um, we would then be able to take this adenovirus, which is E2, be deleted, and use that almost like a gene therapy product. And so we have a background of doing this in H1N1, loss of fever, chikungunya, Zika, um, and HIV even. We then took that platform and then moved it into cancer and, and now into COVID. It was very clear to me that the COVID virus acts very much like a cancer in a sense that one, uh, it interacts with the receptor in the human body, the ACE2 receptor. It finds a way to um, use spike, which is very much like a, a receptor on its own, ligand on its own side. It integrates, it replicates, just like a cancer metastasizes. But most importantly, what it found a way is to avoid immune suppression. It, it, it immune evades, um, and then it causes death uh, across multiple organs in the body. So when we looked at the mechanism of action to, the, to us, this was very much like what we were trying to deal with with regard to cancer and the new epitope. So, you know, the, the, the S1, S2 protein nucleocapsid uh, proteins were something our body has never seen. So to us, this is just another new epitope. So we looked at this, and one of the mechanisms of action that was very clear was this RBD ACE2 receptor. And what was amazing is that the mutation that occurred from SARS-CoV-1 to SARS-CoV-2 was at the RBD level. But the amazing thing about it, a very few mutations increases the affinity and the ability of this binding site. So it's infective is 20 times higher than SARS-CoV. I think that was the difference um, that has instigated this now human-to-human -human transmission. And I thought RBD was very important. Unfortunately, we're going to have a challenge, the same challenge I had with Abraxane. <laughs> Let me sort of explain that. When I developed Abraxane, I entered the, the era of dose-dense chemotherapy, um, high-dose chemotherapy, high-dose radiation, and built Abraxane not because of what it was in terms of we wanted to go metronomic low-dose. So everybody thought that it was like a nutcase, crazy, uh, almost homeopathic idea. And it had nothing to do with the chemotherapy, but it was to do with the immunomodulation and to this day, I'm sure if you speak to your colleagues, do they realize that Abraxane was ready to modulate M2 macrophages to M1 macrophages through a thing called macrophinocytosis? 99% of practicing oncologists say, you have no idea what you're talking about. So if you look now at the vaccinology field of COVID, I turn around and find that we're the only ones that have nucleocapsid in it. And I find that not only surprising, but it, uh, but it also boils down to exact same first principles. The first thing we did was we looked at the wild type spike, which everybody has. And in order for you to get, in my mind at least, um, immune reaction or immune stimulation, you need that uh, RBD at least, which is the most powerful neutralizing antibody site, to be exposed on the surface of the cell which you injected in a human being. And when we did that fundamental studies, we showed that wild type spike, there was very little RBD that was expressed on the surface of cells. And we were all about expression. And so the first thing we did, we figured out a way to modify or optimize this spike, which we call spike fusion. And we were able to push just a little bit of this RBD out on the surface. But when we added nucleocapsid uh, to, and we're still trying to figure out the mechanism, a massive amount of RBD got exposed on the surface. So the combination of nucleocapsid has multiple purposes. One, if you go into the literature, nucleocapsid is the um, conserved 
innards of this RNA from SARS-CoV-1 to SARS-CoV-2, et cetera, and maybe to the next SARS that we're going to get. Um, but the memory T cells exists, and if you look at the literature, for, 20, for 17 years in patients that were infected in 2003, we have found memory, not we, but the literature, the, 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 the group in Singapore, has found memory T cells to N nucleic capsid. So the scientific basis is twofold. One, the nucleic capsid in some way enhances the exposure of RBD, which enhances, therefore, the immunogenicity. The nucleic capsid is, could be a universal COVID. There is now sufficient scientific insight based on the SARS-CoV-1 history that there's long-term memory T cells which then take us a completely down a different route that we're not just interested in utilizing antibodies. That's really important, um, but it has a short life. We're really interested in memory T cells, which is exactly what I call an ant cancer vaccine in cancer, where we're looking at memory T cells. So that was the fundamental basis. There's actually much more than this uh, into how and why we got into the combination of that, of those two. Um, the opportunity then to take um, nucleocapsid, which is an intracytoplasmic or intracellular protein, and put it on the surface was another challenge. And we faced that challenge in cancer with another protein called brachyuri, which is a cytoplasmic protein. And we were able to push it on the surface so that CD4 cells could recognize it. I'm now getting into pretty deep immunology, but CD4 cells or T helper cells are necessary to induce memory T cells when you have CD8 cells. So in order for us to do that, you needed to push it to a thing called MHC2 because it's MHC2 restricted to get CD4 cells. In order to do that, you needed to get through the lysosomal pathway. In order to do that, you need to do intracellular trafficking. <laughs> So we then formulated the intracellular trafficking based on our oncology experience, which we've done, and put that on the nuclear capsid. So it's a very sophisticated approach of not just sort of throwing things at the wall and see what sticks. One, we wanted RBD exposed so we can get maximum neutralizing antibody and you're getting maximum utilization of spike. Two, we wanted more protein to produce, and it turns out that when you have nuclear capsid, you get more protein produced and nuclear capsid is known to be RNA transcriber. Three, we wanted this to uh, induce CD4 cells so that we can get memory T cells. And four, we wanted to mimic what we've seen in patients with convalescent serum in SARS-CoV-1. So that's the long answer to uh, a question of what is the design. Um, so here we are again, um, very much like a Braxane, which I thought was just a fancy Paclitaxel and just conventional wisdom and what the heck is he doing? to the NAND cancer vaccine where I'm using um, metronomic chemo merely to immunomodulate and then using natural killer cells to here our vaccine where we're going with N plus plus S. So I suppose um, our curse is just to follow the science and then apply it. Um, and in the long run, um, uh, we need to find that out through randomized clinical trials. And uh, that's where we hopefully are now.